Today's sermon's coming in two parts. I know the children are still here. We'll get to that later. Don't panic, you'll find it fun near the end. Believe you me, in one form or another. It's in two parts. Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 to 40, state this. Um, the Pharisees are trying to trick Jesus. So, turns around and he says, one of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap him with this question. Jesus, what is the most important uh, commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Then it's love your neighbor as yourself. And we're going to come to love your neighbor as yourself a bit later on. But let's focus, shall we, very, very briefly on love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Easy? No. I sat here and I reflected on this today and I could go into some deep theology behind it all. But we'll be here for hours. What does it mean to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and mind? What does that look like? It's a real question. What does that... Actually, no, it's not a real question. Think about it. I'm not going to come near you. Sorry, I really have got to make that rule today. Um, it feels like a chore, doesn't it? It feels really tough to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, doesn't it? It feels like a real heavy command to do so. It feels like oh, it involves a lot of effort. But I saw it another way that I've never quite seen before. To love the Lord your God with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your strength, means one thing and one thing only. You're focused on him completely. Did you get me for a minute? You're focused on him completely. And when we're focused on him, nothing else matters. So the command to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and everything else that's your being is because the idea is not to make it a heavy command, but it's so that nothing else matters. We, we, we extract everything we are from him. Everything from him. Let's take bodybuilding. I'm clearly an expert in bodybuilding. I do it all the time. If you're somebody who likes a good buff body, like I do, you focus on lifting the weights, don't you? Stop laughing, Karis. I, there's no weights in my house that I lift, other than my own body. But you focus on that. Ever, ever, ever spoken to somebody who loves going to the gym? Anybody lo spoken to anybody who loves going to the gym? Yeah? Now, has anybody actually spoken to someone who goes to the gym and they just won't stop going on about it? Yeah. You with me? And they come home and tell you how many treadmill moments they've had or, or how much weight they've lifted or, or whatever. Yeah? You with me so far? Yeah. Yeah, you've had that person, yeah? And then they start telling you what protein drink they're drinking, yes? Yeah. You with me? And then they sit there and then, then they go, check my arm muscles out. Yeah? I love clerical shirts. They hide a multitude of sins. Yeah? Check my arm. Look at that. They, they really go on about it, didn't they? Have you ever know, been, been near anybody like that? Yeah? yeah? And they, they go... 
I've got antiperspirant on. It's okay. Yeah? And then you have to go, oh, please, give me a break. Great, I'm really pleased for you. But they're so distracted by it. And then when they can't go to the gym because they've become ill, they've pulled a muscle, done a ligament in or something, oh, man, how miserable are they? How, how miserable are they? Yeah, come on, come with me, yeah? They're really miserable. They're just the most miserable bunch. And all they do is go on about how they can't go to the gym and they start going about how their muscles are sagging and if you're a male, it looks like the pecs are becoming something called something less flattering. <laughs> and the tight T-shirts you stop wearing after a while because, boy, it really looks unflattering. Yeah, it's time to get the baggy shirts out now. I was a size small. I now better go to the mediums. In my case, it's to the XLs. So, but they get really miserable because why? Their entire focus on their strength has been poured into lifting weights and looking good on the outside. And so their whole identity is that. But when we love the Lord of God, our God with all our strength, it doesn't matter if we become injured because we don't, he's always there. Does that make sense? So th there's no excuse. We can still spend time with him. And all our strength and all our focus comes from him. And I could talk about the mind and I could talk about our heart, but you get the point that I'm getting at. So when we realize who we are and we focus on our mind, soul and strength, we actually discover who we are in him. Yeah? Because your focus is on him. You're not distracted by what other people say. I mean, nothing worse than after a while you get a little bit fat and people point it out to you. And that hurts, doesn't it? When they suddenly notice that you've got squidgy sides again. I bumped into somebody some month, months and months ago who'd been popping into this church on and off, but they hadn't seen me for a year. And yes, I put on weight. I'm not going to deny that because for the last year I've not been able to go swimming properly for various reasons. And clearly I've put on weight and I can tell by this collar right now, right? But the point being, do you know what the person's first words to have to me? You're fat. <laughs> it was, hi, pastor. You're fat. <laughs> Don't try that. It really hurts. <laughs> and I just looked and I went, Bleh. okay, humility, humility, kicking now, now, now. No, forget it. I'm walking away. No, no, it's fine. It was fine. I said, yeah, you're right. I am. Congratulations. Good observation. <laughs> How's your spiritual life, by the way? Oh, that's what I thought. So, um, no, no, I'm joking. So, and that hurts. But when we're focused on the Lord with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, we don't care what anybody else says. Because God goes, but I love you. When you say focused on the Lord, I know this is all about identity, but we need to really get this in our thick skulls. And I say our thick skulls, all right? So I'm including myself. We have to realize who we are in God. And how magnificent we are and how glorious we are. How gorgeous we are. Because God made us. And God says we're glorious. God says we're magnificent. God says no matter whether you're super fit or super fat, you're still beautiful. So that command about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength wasn't just about serving him, some like weak um, person who's just under oppression from God and I must serve him. It's actually because you're focused on him and what he says about you. So all that words, what, what fashion says about you, what culture says about you, does not matter. It's what God says. But if you're not worshipping the Lord your God, not focused on him with all your soul, mind and strength, you're automatically distracted by everything else. And then that starts becoming painful and that starts becoming damaging. And it doesn't say serve, does it? It says you must love. Loving one's own body, whether it's fit or not, is not a good thing. Because our bodies are decaying, whether we like it or not. 
But God doesn't decay, does he? So loving the Lord our God, putting all our focus on to him, is the best place to be. And everything else doesn't matter. Who we are and how we look doesn't matter if we are focused and loving the Lord our God with all our strength, all our heart and all our mind. Because it's where we get our identity from. It gets a, an identity at the moment in our nation is a big deal. I am not, hear me very carefully, people who are struggling with their identity, I am not having a go at. But, you know, people in the media now, the new thing, I think it's Sam Smith, I'm not, hear me very carefully, I'm not having a go at Sam Smith, it's just a good example because it's in the public eye, is that he wants to be referred to as they and them, rather than he or she. The singer. Now, it's become a big deal. Being non-binary or ident trying to identify it has become a big deal. And it's just one more step along the way about identity. Prior to that, it's about with your trans. It's just about identity. Everything's about identity. And all of us, one level of degree, drive our identity from something other than God. But if we focus and love the Lord our God with all our mind and all our heart and all our strength, that's where the focus will be. Because we could be so easily distracted. So it's not, a, it's not an onious command. Actually, the command is not about, you must love. It's, you must love, because actually that's the only place that real identity will come from. It doesn't come from anywhere else. And when we focus on that, we discover how much we're his and how much we are citizens of his and his kingdom. So where we come from, whether I was born in Amwell, West London, really does not make a jot of difference about my identity. It's part of how I think and I am culture, but my real identity comes from God, doesn't it? And that changes the whole focus of who we are. Now, you'll notice, as I pointed out earlier on, that I'm wearing jeans today. I have not worn jeans on a Sunday morning in church for over 11 years. I used to wear jeans all the time prior to coming into ministry. I wear this clothing and this get up six days of the week otherwise. And yes, that's the big Jesus belt that I was going on about that people notice more than they notice my collar. It's a bit covered by the large belly at the moment, but it, that will soon be changed. Don't worry. Danny, I haven't seen you for years. Nice having you here, Manchester. So, seriously, and the point I wore it today was, well, who are you being most of the time? Are you being true to who you are in Christ, or are you putting on an image for everybody else, including yourself? Or are you actually being true to who you are in Jesus? There's a thought for you. So love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your strength because then you re realize how gloriously beautiful you are. Go on, Ranjan, you're sh showing me something. What? I saw you focusing... Thank you, that's what I thought. Thank you, that's what you... No, that's great. Do you see this? Listen, I, I, I like interruptions, because God's normally talking when there's an interruption. Other times it's Satan, but that's not in this case. Everything... Sorry, I'm not knocking that one, that's lovely, and it's still slightly damp. Um... 
He has made everything beautiful in its time. And for a time. So who do you think that refers to? I know there's flowers, and they're gorgeous, aren't they? It's a lovely picture, isn't it? But guess what? You're more beautiful than this. And you, can you all see that? Because you've been made beautiful for today. Actually, yeah, I'm going to tag on from a sermon I heard yesterday. It's very true. You've been made for today. Did you know that? God's made you unique, yes? And he's made you for such a time as today. So when he makes everything beautiful in its time, it's for today. And that includes you children, by the way. I know you're bored, and I don't blame you. I would be as well by now. But you're all made beautiful for today. You've been put into this time, for this season, for this reason, because God loves you. And he's made you amazing. So when you can learn to love the Lord your God with all your mind, all your soul, all your your soul, uh, mind, heart, strength, you will know how beautiful you really are. And you won't give a hoot what anybody else says. Amen? Okay. End of part one. We'll come to part two later. Actually, no, we won't. We haven't finished. Do you actually know who you really are and how beautiful you are? I want to ask you a question. When you walk into a room, do you walk in humble? Do you walk in scared? Do you walk in with an apology that I'm here? When you walk into a room, do you walk in with a sense of, I'm sorry that I've arrived? No? You know exactly who you are in Christ? So if you're walking into an office, do you realize how much you're walking in the kingdom of God and and walking in his authority? Do you actually know that you're walking in Jesus Christ at that point and in his authority? When you walk into your office, when you walk into your family home, when you walk into the cafe or wherever else, do you actually know that you're walking in with a sense of, hello, I'm a Christian. And I bring all the authority of heaven and earth with me pouring into this room right now because I love the Lord my God with all my mind, all my heart and all my strength and I know exactly who I am. No, we don't. Because if we did, there'd be a ton ten of people that would be radically changed by our walk with Christ. When we walk in, we walk in with the full authority of our Lord Jesus Christ fully in front of us and fully behind us. Amen? Why do you wear a suit to work? I'm not knocking wearing a suit to work. But why do you wear a suit to work? Dress code. Imposed dress code, I bet. Yeah. Somebody tells you how you should dress. So, By the way, I'm not having some subversive moment this morning with wearing me jeans. Right, hear me very carefully. And again, maybe I am. No, I'm not. But a dress code that's imposed on you. So when you walk into a room of business, suits, dressing, I mean, nurses, you do need to wear a uniform. It's useful to know that you're actually the nurse and not somebody who should be on the ward in, as a patient. But you walk into that room. I have to wear a uniform, wear this, but I don't mind wearing this. That's fine. Dress code that's imposed on you, that puts an image on you that maybe you don't want to carry. I remember in my old job, we had to wear suits and ties all the time. And then they went, dress down Friday. We're converting. We're going to have dress down Fridays. We're like, yes! You can come in in anything you want as long as it's respectable, which is understandable. Nobody wants to see my wobbly bits, right? That's fine. But then they turned around and said, ah, but if you've got a meeting happening that day, obviously respect the people that you're meeting, so maybe you need to wear your suit and tie on the day. So you ready for this? So you could be having a meeting with somebody in our office, an external person that you're meeting. So what happens is you go and greet them and bring them up. Now, you're in your shirt, tie, and whatever else on a Friday. The rest of the open plan office are all in T-shirts, shorts, and whatever else they want to wear. But somehow, 
me wearing a shirt and a tie and a suit somehow is going to project an image to the person I'm meeting that says, don't panic, we're not having a casual day. Even though I just walked you all the way through the office, where clearly we are. But an imposed image of who you are is put on you by our society, yes? And by our culture. Yet, we walk in that identity sometimes forgetting who we really are. That when we walk in, we go, I am Christ's own. This is me. Welcome. Is it just me or are you all quite happy? You're happy that you don't have to think about what to wear that day because somebody's told you. No. But we like to walk in, but we forget who we are. It's just an outward appearance of who we forget we are when we walk into situations and rooms. That this is me. I'd like us to try it one day. Actually, all of you to walk into your places of work, college, whatever, school, and go, this is me. Children, you have to wear school uniform. Let's make this very clear. You have to, when you get to sixth form, wear what you like, apparently. Depends on what school you go to. But it's not so much what we wear on the outside. It actually reflects who we think we are on the inside. Worship the Lord your God. Love him with all your strength, all your mind. Then you'll find out who you are. Because we all get hurt by what is said around us. Yes? Yeah? Yeah? Because it's, it's, it, it's what the world says. It's what people, our work colleagues might say about us. It's what our school friends might say about us. That's not nice. But ignore all of those because God says you're beautiful. You're glorious. You're the most amazing thing that I have ever created next to the next person. You are beautiful in this time. And all God's people should be saying... But he is. Do you know God's actually proud of you? Well, he made you. Even when we mess up, he still loves us. Anybody know that song, This Is Me, from The Greatest Showman? Yeah? Come on, children. You must all know it, surely. No? Yeah? Yeah? Good song? No. Do you really? Uh, if you hear about once a week here, you don't. You love it. Right, okay. hundred times at school, you're sick of it. But do you not find it rousing? No? Hang on, I'm talking to the youth at the moment, Steve. Do you not find it... Sorry, please help me out, daughter. Please save me. Do you find it cheerful? I mean, it's cheerful, but it's not rousing. It's just a bit overplayed. Yeah, I agree. <sighs> the words normally say, I'm going to send the flood. It will drown... Um, I'll drown them out. That's the normal words. But actually, when you look to his blood... The words he will dry out. When we recognize who we are in Jesus, that takes out the sharpest words. That takes out the bullets that are chucked at us because this is who we are in Christ. So I'd like us to change the words of the song. I'd love to be able to do that publicly one day. You never know. Change it a little bit more. Maybe the worship team might like to try and learn it. That'd be cool, wouldn't it? Really annoy all the children now and you can listen to it even more. Ad infinitum. But when the words are changed to a song ever so slightly, it is true. This is who, it is me. And it's not because you're saying, look how great I am. It's look how great I am because of who Christ is in me. And you're going to want to know this Jesus because he'll remind you how great you are. Does this sound okay to you? Don't do unto others what you don't want done unto you. Does that sound okay? Don't do to others what you don't want done to yourself, yeah? Okay. Um, how about this one? 
do not do to anyone what you yourself would hate. Shall I repeat that, shall I? Do not do to anyone what you yourself would hate. Is that okay? Sounds logical, doesn't it? Don't, don't do to, do not do anything to anyone that you yourself wouldn't want done to yourself. Yeah? So if you don't like Marmite, don't give somebody else Marmite, yeah? Do you know who's, where those two quotes come from? Conf Thanks, Keith. You stole my thunder. You're right. Confucius is the first one. Don't do unto others what you would do to yourselves. Confu Confucius. And the other one, and Confucius is about 500-something BC, something along those lines. And the other one, do not do to anyone what you yourself would hate, was by Rabbi Hillel about 20 BC. So about 20 years before Jesus. So then when we hear this one, love your neighbor as yourself, do we like that one? Sounds just like the other ones, doesn't it? It's a similar ilk, yeah? Is Jesus copying two other people? Ooh. The Son of God was there before them, but not Jesus Christ. Jesus was the man. The Son of God was the... Let's, let's not get into Trinity, but yes, Beatrice. On one level, you're right, the Son of God was there first. But it was Jesus that taught this, because obviously 500 BC is before Christ, so that's Confucius. 20 BC was Rabbi House. It was 20 years before Jesus was even born. Um, sorry, you're all probably going, what are you talking about? Jesus Christ, the man, only came about 2,000 years ago. The Son of God, or God the Son, has been here since eternity. There's a distinct difference between the two, because it's the God the Son who became flesh in Jesus Christ. Sorry, I wasn't want to go into Trinitarian theology, but there you go. Anyway, so uh, the other way of looking at the quote from Jesus, which is love your neighbor as yourself, which he got from Leviticus 19, is do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. Okay? So that's another way. So I want to take those sort of four in a brackets, and I want us to look at those completely just for a moment. So love your neighbor as yourself sounds fairly different, isn't it? Let me explain to you what my problem is. Confucius, don't do unto others what you would want done unto you, is basically a negative. It's a negative. If I don't want somebody to hurt me, I don't want somebody to punch me. What's the best way if you follow Confucius's style is that I don't punch someone else. So I don't do anything. It's a passive. So if I don't do anything, therefore then by karmic thinking, they shouldn't do anything to me. If I don't want hurtful words to come my way, how about if I try not be hurtful to others? So as long as I don't do something wrong, hopefully bad things shouldn't come to me. So if I treat people without doing anything bad to them, bad things shouldn't come my way. Okay? So that's a negative way of dealing with it. And Rabbi Heliel was exactly the same. It's exactly the same format. Don't do something to somebody else that you would hate done to you. So it's a negative. It's as in, don't do anything. But loving your neighbor is an active thing. Love your neighbor as yourself has a positivity about it. Because you're the instigator of having to do some loving. Do you see the difference? You have to love, actively love the other person. Just like that. Thank you for the comic timing.
So think about your neighbours just for a minute. I assume you all have neighbours, unless you live in some vast farmland estate that I know nothing about, and let's have a conversation. You have neighbours, yes? Yeah, they could be above you, below you, to the side of you, diagonally, but we all have neighbours in one form or another. And as Jesus said, everybody's our neighbour anyway. Not just your next door neighbours, but everybody's your neighbour. So we all have neighbours. So think about them a moment. Think about their needs. If you know your neighbour, if you don't know your neighbour, why not? Did they only move in yesterday? I've always told the story how I met our neighbours two doors up. They crashed into our car. That's how we met them. They only lived in the road for one week. They re- pu- re- went into my mother-in-law's car and mother in and that's how I met them. And we get along like a house on fire now. A few years later, they've even started to come to the parent toddler group. So think about your neighbours, their needs. What can you do to show them love? Think about their needs. It's a positive action to go and show them love. So, so what can you do, do you think, to show them love? It's sort of partly Q&A. There are two people at the back that really want me to go to them, but I'm not, because they know that. I... It's all right, don't worry, Keith, you're all right, go on. Do you want them to go first? No, no, no I don't want to go to them at all. No. Okay, one of my favorite stories... When Milo was about four, we were washing the windows in our front garden, and I finished the job. That was it. And then he kind of looked at me as if the job wasn't finished. So we, I should preface this story by saying we do know our next door neighbors. We're good friends with them. Uh, so I said, why are you looking at me like that? He said, we still have more windows to do. I said, what windows? He said, Nemal's windows, we have to carry on. I said, no, no, we don't really have to. He said, no, you have to love your neighbor as yourself. You have to keep doing it, (laughs) keep going with the windows. And then I had that karmic crossroads, which is, well, I should just mind my own business. What if he doesn't want his windows done? But I carried on and I washed his windows. He wasn't around. I don't know if he ever knew, but I think it was the right thing to do. Okay, thank you. That's a positive, isn't it? And I'm sure we've all got neighbours we know are elderly or not well, and we might take dinner to them, or we might take uh, food to them, we might help them, we might drive them to the hospital and back, yeah? And we see that, do, yeah, it's loving our neighbour. Or you might volunteer in the eating food bank. I was having a conversation with somebody about that yesterday. You know, that's loving your neighbour, or that's where we take it to, of loving our neighbour. I've done... Nice things for them. So I looked at this Bible passage for the very first time and saw something I'd never seen before in reference to loving your neighbour as yourself. Do you love yourself? I love that people nod and go, yeah, but actually, not a lot of us do. Because we forget who we are in Christ, and that's the whole point. So, first part of the message, when you know who you are in Jesus Christ, you love yourself. Not in a narcissistic way, but in a, well, Jesus loves me, God loves me, God made me, blah, 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 so who am I not to love myself? Does that make sense? And actually, it's quite an interesting fact. I have some people coming in when they see me, and they've done something wrong and over the years, and they've not forgiven themselves, and I look at them after a while, and I say, do you think God's forgiven you? Yes, God has forgiven me. So why haven't you forgiven yourself? Oh, I can't forgive myself. So, sorry, when did you become God? And they went, why? I said, well, if God's forgiven you, how dare you not forgive yourself? You've just put yourself above God by not forgiving yourself. If the creator and the universe can forgive you, why can't you? 
seems to shatter. And some of you might have been in this room and might well have heard me say that to you personally. That sort of shatters you because you realize you're making yourself bigger than God. So when you recognize that you are a child of God and that you're loved by God, how dare you not love yourself? With me so far? So when we can love ourselves, which is our biggest struggle, we struggle to love our neighbor. Because really what we're doing is projecting onto our neighbor our own stuff. But anyway, let's go to loving our neighbor. So we love our neighbor by cleaning their windows. 15 years, my neighbor still not washed my car, even though I keep asking him. I think he's rather selfish. When he comes to Christ, maybe he might change his mind. <clears throat> I really need some throat lozenges now. So, so loving our neighbor, when we love ourselves and we know that God loves us, has turned into a nice... Nice thing to do, yes? When you can learn to love your neighbor. But you love yourself because Jesus loves you, yes? How did Jesus love you? How do you know that Jesus loves you? He died. How do you know that he died for your sins, Keith? It's an historical fact, okay? But how do you know? Someone told you, thank you. So when we take love thy neighbor as yourself, what do you think I'm going to convert that into now when I realize the power of those words? What is the best way you can love your neighbor? You're all trying, some are whispering, some are a bit louder now. What is the best way you can love your neighbor? Clean their windows. We'll have a conversation later. Let's do that again until you get it because the problem is you know what that's actually really saying to you. What's the best way you can love your neighbor? Share the gospel. Nothing else matters. Cleaning the windows, a lovely idea. Brilliant idea. It shows an element of Christ's sacrifice and Christ's love to your neighbor when you do nice things for them. But ultimately, it is the smallest part of the big whole, which is the biggest sacrifice you can give and serve them, is tell them the gospel of Jesus Christ and how they can be saved and how they can have life eternal. If you can't do that, you're not loving your neighbor as yourself. Because you know the words of truth, you've received them, you have them, you have life eternal. How dare we not also love our neighbor as ourself? There's a point that being nice is not good enough. Being really loving is self-sacrificingly telling them that Jesus loves them. That Jesus has saved them. They just need to give their life to him. And to pray that prayer of salvation with them. Over the set years, love your neighbor has turned into nice social works. We forget. Because when you love the Lord your God with all your heart. Don't forget this is a whole wrap up that Jesus did in one thing. Love the Lord your God. With all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength. When you've got that focus on him, and you know how much you are loved by him, then it's love your neighbor as yourself. Well, I know I'm loved by God. So what's the best way for my neighbor to know that I love them? Is to give them the gospel. I will no longer have fear about what they're going to say to me, because I know how much I am loved by God. And that's exactly what happened yesterday. People went out knowing not to be scared anymore. And then when they started seeing results, 116 people gave their lives to Jesus in one hour. Out of 251 people going up. Hello? That's God at work. That's loving your neighbor. Let's be honest. When's the last time you told your neighbor that Jesus, and I mean your immediate neighbor, that Jesus loved them? Have you ever told them? Might be you're scared to tell them because they go, but all the shouting I hear from your house, what do you mean you're a Christian? Don't worry about that. Let God sort that bit out. Mm -hmm. 
Why have you never told your neighbor that Jesus loves them? Sorry, I'm really hammering this. Why have you never told them? I, I had a great debate this week. One of my neighbors, we were doing some shouting out, and he said something or other, and I said, yeah, but Jesus loves you. You know that. And I, I remember thinking, oh, what's he going to think of me now? And that's stupid, isn't it? Because I'm a pastor for crying out loud. It's blatantly obvious I go to church, and it's blatantly obvious I have something to do with Jesus Christ. But the problem is actually when you tell somebody, you know, Jesus loves you. And he wants the very best for you and all that sort of stuff, but you just need to give his life to him. It's strange how we sit, those words choke in our throat, don't they? they they're going to think I'm a weirdo. Congratulations, welcome to the rest of us. Let them join. But the words choke in our throat because fear has got them just there. But if we're going to love our neighbor as ourselves, respectfully to each of us, being nice to them, taking a hot plate of food and all that's all lovely and wonderful. Maybe by osmosis, they might understand that Christ loves them. Maybe when I bring round this, this, this tin foil of, of hot food for them or a nice cake that I've baked for them, they'll somehow understand that Jesus loves them and they've got to give their life to him. They've got to understand that they have fallen short of the glory of God like all of us and that they're going to hell unless Jesus, they give their life to Jesus. And that's where they're going, folks. Let's make no bones about this. Don't give your life to Jesus. Don't have a relationship with him in any way, shape or form. Hell is where they're ending up. I know in our modern society we like to soften it now a little bit and maybe make it feel a little bit nicer for us and a little bit more like, well, maybe not. As I had somebody this week say to me, oh, well, they accepted me as a Christian. Though they never actually gave their life to Jesus, they accepted me as a Christian, so I'm going to take it that from that Bible verse about accepting somebody who is, that means therefore they're in heaven. What? Awful as it sounds, and we've all got family, we've all got friends who may never accepted Jesus and have now died. And it's the worst thing to be hearing right now. But this is about our neighbours going forward. This is about our family going forward who are still with us. They need Jesus Christ in their lives. And you're the one with the message. It's no good going. God's going to give it plan B to somebody else to do. You're the one that God has made beautiful in this time. He's the one who's put you right in place wherever you're living right now so that everybody else around you knows the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your plan A for your neighbor. Not me, not Steve, not Timmy. You are plan A for your neighbor. So loving them, loving them, is telling them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And stop shying away from it. God is already doing the work. He's already prepared people to receive the gospel. But if we don't open our mouths, it's not going to happen. Because I hate to say this, God works in partnership with us. How many times have you prayed for your neighbor or prayed for your family or prayed that they will come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? And you pray and you pray and you pray and you're going to say, some point they're going to ask me the question, surely, surely they're going to ask me. No, they're not. The one thing, funny enough, the turnings taught is actually people don't come and ask the question. We have to be bold enough in the authority in the kingdom of God to step in and go, Hi, I'm a Christian. Jesus loves you, by the way. And watch them go, Really? 
And ask him the next question. And actually, the next question is genuinely is, can I ask you, without a shadow of a doubt, do you know exactly where you're going to go if, if you're going to get into heaven if you die today? You'd be amazed how many people probably go, um, well, no, I'm not 100% sure. But unless we're that bold, because actually we're scared now to turn around to people and say, do you know, you, do, you, do you actually really think you're going to get into heaven if you die today? We're almost scared to have that conversation. And that stops the gospel being said. So loving your neighbor is what? That's it. That's loving your neighbor. Jesus said, you'll always have the poor. You'll always have the sick. They'll always be here. And we show them works of service them to maybe open up doors, maybe to, to walk in just so we can generate a relationship, not re- slamming into their parked cars. You might do that just to welcome them in, you know. Hi, welcome. Here's a bag of sugar. Oh, sorry, yeah, you can't have sugar. There's tax on it now. Um, here's a plate of biscuits. That's just being welcoming and loving. That's, that's just opening up doors to start having conversation. But there's a point in the relationship you have to go, Jesus loves you. Can we have a discussion about that? If it helps, I've been greatly challenged by that as well in regards to um, my own situation. I have every intention to make amends to that in the next two weeks. By the very fact you're all silent, I'm assuming you're roughly in the same boat than I am. few moments to spend time with the Lord. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.